So up next, we're going to have a great conversation uh, between uh, with, with uh, Lieutenant General Harry Radigy and our next guest. I'd like to bring Harry on and uh, and uh, and have a great conversation here with General Murray, who stood up Army Futures Command. So, Harry, are you with us, sir? There he is. And General Mike Murray, uh, I'm a big fan of both of you and the work you've done. Uh, General Murray, what you did with the uh, Army Futures Command, outstanding, stellar. It's really kind of a an anchor here in Austin around the defense innovation uh, community. So I'm going to turn it over to, to uh, Lieutenant General Harry, Harry Radigy, and I look forward to your all's conversation. Thanks, David. Great. Well, thank you very much, David. And uh, General Murray, uh, it's great seeing you again. Uh, we go way back also. We just had uh, General Keith Alexander on here uh, just a, a couple minutes ago. And uh, it's always wonderful to see my, uh, my former colleagues in uh, our nation's cloth. Uh, but, you know, uh, General Murray, I got to say that I've really been looking forward to uh, this fireside chat. Uh, we have known each other now, and I was calculating this quickly, uh, over, well, just about 40 years. Uh, when we when we were very young in the military, uh, but we were uh, close neighbors, uh, our families knew each other. Matter of fact, my son, uh, who and my daughter, uh, and my son being a, a brigadier general today, uh, used to babysit uh, for you so that you and Jane could get out for a, a little uh, uh, R and R on your own uh, on the weekends. So we go way back, and and I'll tell you, uh, frankly, I, I feel it was has been a real shame that I haven't been able to have time with you since your retirement to just sit down uh, and catch up a bit. And uh, we now have a bit of time to do that uh, and to talk a little about your uh, last uh, assignment in in military uniform as the first. Commanding General of the Army Futures Command. And for our audience, let me just add that uh, General Murray served uh, in, in our nation's uniform for just short of 40 years as an Army infantry officer. And uh, he had four highly successful commands, uh, Battalion Command uh, with the 18th Infantry Regiment, uh, 3rd Brigade Combat Team with the 1st Cavalry Division, 3rd uh, Infantry Division Commander, and, uh, and then finally, uh, and what we're going to talk about today uh, as the commander of the U.S. Army Futures Command. And I've got just to say a little bit about the Army Futures Command. Frankly, when I saw the announcement that the Army was going to stand this up, and I saw that you, my good friend, had been tapped uh, to, to lead this new command. I wondered how in the world you were going to settle into a location, a new location uh, in, in Austin, Texas, how you were going to properly staff this unique new organization uh, with the right people, and then to outline where the Army uh, should go in the future. Uh, certainly uh, a huge task. And uh, the Army has lots of moving parts, literally. And here you were uh, going to be handling and considering everything from combat vehicles uh, to field artillery to drones and perhaps and, and certainly most importantly, the survival needs of our individual soldiers. So uh, AFC. Uh, has been given a huge responsibility. It continues today. Uh, and officially, I looked it up, the uh, simply stated uh, Army Futures Command exists to transform the Army to ensure war-winning future readiness. So over the past four or so years, uh, you became uh, the commander of the newest of the Army's four major commands. You grew to over 17,000 people worldwide. You, you were established to ensure that the Army and its soldiers remain at the forefront of technological innovation and warfighting ability. 
and I might add that that uh, involves the subject of today, which is lots of dual use technology. Uh, and uh, also, I think it's important to note that today, uh, Army Futures Command current focus is number one, prioritizing people. Uh, number two, designing the Army of 2040 and delivering Army 2030. Huge responsibilities. But I want, with that short introduction of not only you, uh, but also what you were responsible for, I want to welcome you to, uh, uh, to our, our show today. Well, thanks, Harry. And it's uh, to give people an idea, it was Captain Murray when we lived down just uh, two or three houses down from you. So a lot of fond memories. And, and uh, one of the one of my daughters that your son and daughter baby, babysat for, I just was with her today, I, and she just turned 34. So if that doesn't make you feel old, it makes me feel old. But it's great to be with you today, and thanks for all the, the comments and compliments. Great, great. Well, I'll tell you, as advertised, I want to launch into uh, this fireside chat. You know, normally we might be just sitting uh, someplace having a coffee or maybe an adult beverage. Uh, but uh, uh, today we've got a few more people uh, listening and looking in on us. But I want to start with uh, with the stand up of Army Futures Command in 2018 uh, until you retired three years later uh, in 2021. What do you think uh, that you and your team got right uh, at, at Futures Command and with that massive mission responsibility? Well, and and. First thing I'd say, Harry, is, um, and I'm glad you said my team, because um, it, it always, everything's a team sport, and this was absolutely a team sport. And, and I think back to August of 18, when we stood up the command, and Secretary was there, uh, Secretary Esper at the time, Under Secretary McCarthy was there, General Milley was there, General McConville was there, so the entire leadership team. And we we started with uh, well-defined priorities in terms of modernization for the Army. Um, and I credit uh, past leadership and current leadership that the Army still has this, the, the same six modernization priorities. And so consistency in messaging, consistency in funding uh, has gained congressional support. And I think that, you know, throughout the life cycle, uh, short life cycle of Army Futures Command, that consistency in what the Army's priorities are for modernization has paid huge dividends. But that day after we stood it up, and everybody was there for the party to stand it up. Uh, I went to work the next day and it was me and 12 of my best friends. Um, and, you know, the Army didn't give me a chance to, to stand it up. It's like the, that same day they were calling, wanting to know, you know, how that ACOM Army Command, Major Army Command was contributing to the Army's mission. Um, and so it was, I tell people all the time that it, some people described it as building an airplane in flight, and we weren't building an airplane because we didn't have the parts. We were ordering the parts to build an airplane in flight. Um, but I I used to describe, and I still do, those early days as a startup, the, the, the headquarters there in Austin, trying to build itself and manage a merger because you mentioned the 17,000 plus and we very quickly, after we stood up to headquarters, starting acquiring commands from other organizations, uh, what was RDE Com at that time from Army Material Command, uh, the Medical Command, um, and uh, what was at that time ARCIC and now Futures and Concept Center. So that I think the hard part uh, early in the process was, was actually building the command, which as I look back and you mentioned about successes, some of the failures, I think I underestimated how hard that was going to be to build a command from scratch and bring in different organizations with different organizational cultures and, and try to get them focused on, you know, a common mission. Uh, I think I spent too much time away from the headquarters the first year. I probably should have stayed closer to the headquarters and focused on that. But the Army was was putting demands on not only the organization, but me personally. And so we did a lot of traveling. Um, I think, you know, and, and since I've gotten out, I'm dealing with some companies now we're taught and I'm learning about mergers and acquisitions, which I never really studied before, but organizational culture and cultural fit, I think is one of the key things. And that's probably where I should have spent more time focused on. I think we, we, there was a push to hire, uh, quickly. 
which I resisted and fought because I thought it was more important to hire the right people as opposed to hire the right number of people. So we spent a lot of time focused on hiring the right people. And I think we pretty much got that right. And then establishing the culture and then understanding there was an unwritten, I mean, you, you gave the mission, there was an unwritten mission there uh, that I got verbally several times is to speed up and challenge the bureaucracy. Um, and I think another big lesson learned is that you can rail against the bureaucracy all day long and you're going to get nowhere is how do you change it from inside the bureaucracy? And so we've spent a lot of time focused on that as well with a lot of great partners, especially uh, the Assistant Secretary of the Army for Acquisition, Logistics and Technology. I used to tell people all the time that AFC uh, can't acquire anything. Uh, we can do early prototyping, we can write requirements, so we can put material in the hands of soldiers to make sure that we get that right. And I called that soldier-centered design, but then eventually something has to go to the acquisition community to produce and procure it. Um, and so a lot of great partnerships. And then another thing I think the Army got right was the cross-functional teams, which is really just a marriage between an acquisition officer and a requirements owner. And that them working the same problems day by day, all focused on the right outcomes for our soldiers, I think were some early successes. Yeah, I would imagine that you had uh, quite an interaction with uh, our friends at the, uh, uh, our mutual friends at the Army Materiel Command, another four-star command. Yeah, Gus Perna at the time, uh, and now Ed Daly, Daly in my career, Ed Daly. Um, a, a lot, and of course, you know, the, the major organization that AFC um, acquired, if you will, uh, came from AMC, and that's uh, what we now call Combat Capabilities Development Command. So all the Army's labs, uh, you know, and, and responsibility for the execution of basically, uh, well, all of the 6-1, the basic research and applied research, and then some of the, most of the the 6-3 through 6-5, the more developmental research and the maturation of the technologies. Well, massive undertaking. So on, on the uh, flip side uh, of, of my earlier question, what do you think uh, might not have gone as well as uh, you hoped for or expected? Yeah, the um, and I mentioned part of it is, you know, that's I underestimated the difficulty. And, and you mentioned this and, and you've been in jobs. Every job I walked into, I opened the top right hand desk drawer and there's a there's a standard operating procedure. There's a calendar of what the unit has done for the last six months. There's a calendar of what the plan is for the next six months. And I walked into Army Futures Command and opened the, the top right-hand desk drawer. And it was, there There may have been a pencil in there. Um, and so I, that was, I think, one of the, my major failings is understanding where I needed to focus a lot more effort. And we overcame that eventually. Um, I think, you know, it's, we talk a lot about, um, it, it is still it's still going on is and, and the reason Army Futures Command was placed in Austin, besides the barbecue, is that to reach out to non-traditionals, the entrepreneurs, the startups, and figure out easier ways to bring them into and and really lend uh, their capabilities, take advantage of what they're developing um, in a in a more rapid fashion and, and really at all at that point. I, I don't think we are there yet. I think it's still way too hard for a young company or a startup um, to, to really even figure out how to do business with DOD. I, and I don't think that's their fault. I think it's DOD's fault. I'll just say our fault because we tend to make it difficult. Um, and I think, you know, DOD is going to go have to go more than halfway to enable this. We stood up an organization called the Army Applications Lab, uh, which is similar to AFWorks, similar to SoftWorks, similar to NavalX. And I think all of them uh, still have a ways to go. I know Army Applications Lab does. And we tried all kinds of ways to make it easier to work, easier for small companies, entrepreneurs to work with the Army. Um, not completely successful. I think we still got some more work to, to do there. Um, I think, you know, we, we struggled for a little bit with the, uh, with honing the requirements process. And you go back in history uh, just 10 years ago, 
um, you know, a normal developmental program for a major combat system, it was about, this is called 12 to 15 years from good idea to delivering a capability um, and, and really not even completely delivering the capability, just start delivering the capability 12 to 15 years. And, and part of that was the requirements process. Um, and that was, um, you know, good, well-intended people writing requirements that just couldn't been, be met from today's technology uh, or a manufacturing uh, risk or a, an integration risk. And, you know, we struggled to get that process streamlined for probably about the first year. Um, because like I said, it was a, it was a five-year process and, and we wanted to get it done in, in no more than five months, uh, which would be a significant reduction at the front end of a program. Um, you know, it took me a while to, to just sit back and, and, and I tell people this all the time, Harry, is somebody gave me the book Lean Startup to read. And I have no, probably because we were starting with like 12 people. Um, and like most books, I had the time to read skim about the first three or four chapters and the, you know, the central idea of putting a product in your customer's hand and getting feedback before you go into production. And, and that's mostly about software, but I couldn't figure out why the army had never capitalized on putting capability prototypes in soldiers' hands and making sure we understand what it is they want and, and why they want it before we finalize the requirements documents. We, we turn the requirements process around and started doing um, basically draft requirements documents just to get a prototype built, gave it to soldiers, and then finalize the requirements document after we understood the technology, we understood what was possible, not only from a technology standpoint, but from an industry standpoint, and we understood exactly what it was soldiers needed and were after, and we had their input up front. And that's, that just it took me too long uh, to get to that. And then, you know, and General Rainey now says modernization is much more material. And that's absolutely true. It took too long to get started on something that you mentioned, you know, the Army of 2040. You know, and you go back to that developmental cycle, you know, the Army is going to have to produce some requirement documents pretty quick if you want material filled within 2040, just because it takes time. Um, and it just, I, I don't think it was the point where I wanted it to be when I handed it off uh, to, to Jim Richardson and then General Rainey. Great. Well, again, I can't, uh, I can't imagine the massive undertaking uh, you had uh, walking in and, uh, and taking that huge uh, uh, responsibility on and, and mission uh, that you were helping and have helped to define uh, over time as it has evolved. Um, you know, you've been, uh, you've been retired now from the army, not from life for sure, uh, for 15 months or so, but sometimes, you know, you take a look back, um, at the opportunity you had, and I just wonder if you could give us, um, uh, maybe some insights into what you, you were most proud of, you know, as the accomplishments of, of, uh, you and your team. Yeah, and that that's uh, that's a long list, um, and and once again, I, I'm thrilled that you highlighted the team because, I mean, I was I was uh, the leader of the team, but the team did all the work, and and I, none of this would have been possible without them. So I think we made some, and I mentioned soldier centered design. I think that is, I'm knocking on wood. I hope that has caught on in the army because I think it has paid huge div, huge dividends. Um, and I think, you know, soldiers are more inclined to be part of the solution when you involve them up front. It just, there was too many times in my career where we would be issued uh, some material uh, by big army and, and to be honest with you, it didn't ever make it out of the connex because soldiers, it was 15 year old technology and, and soldiers were looking at it like, I don't know, have any idea why I would carry this thing on my back because it's not doing anything for me. So, you know, understanding that up front, and I do think uh, General McConville talks about the, the 24 by 23. So I think we accelerated the delivery of capability. It wasn't, you know, in some cases it was um, less than three years from idea to delivery of capability. In some cases will be five years, some cases it's, it's longer. Uh, but I, I am proud that we were able to work with our acquisition partners and really accelerate getting capability in the soldiers' hands. Um, 
Army Applications Lab, although they, I think we, the Army writ large has a way to go in terms of working with small business and entrepreneurs. I think Army Applications Lab has, has taken a big bite uh, out of that. Um, the software factory, uh, very proud of the software factory there in Austin. And I'll, given your roots, I'll, I'll graciously say I stole the idea from the Air Force and their Kessel Run experience. And and then I'll, uh, I'll guardedly say, given your roots, that I think we got a better idea, the better implementation plan than the Air Force. And that was, that was, you know, I said, uh, modernization is more than capability. It's also about people. And I just became convinced that on a future battlefield, and it goes back to what Palmer was talking about, um, you know, the ability to detect, to as, under, assess, understand, and act faster than an adversary in the future, I, I do think is an asymmetric advantage. So I agree with him 100% on that and have for a long time. And so I, I was convinced that we needed that talent organically. And just a, a quick story, I was told by more than one person that the Army doesn't have that type of talent, uh, the coding talent uh, that's resident there in Austin now. And I said, well, let's just prove that true or false. So we just hung a simple banner on the website that said, if, you're, if you can code, we want to talk to you. Uh, within two days, we had 2,500 applications for 30 slots. Of, of soldiers that are in were in uniform interested in doing that for the army and they've got five cohorts there now of 30 each and, and the application is still just instrumental and they're doing amazing work turning out software uh that that are affecting soldiers each and every day it's not software that goes into a weapons platform it's software that's helping soldiers do their jobs more efficiently we don't have time uh, for all the examples and i think finally um and this came to me probably a little bit too late is pro what we call project convergence and all the services have a, a similar concept and it really gets after that you know how do you and it's you know you go back to john boyd and the ooda loop i mean it's just another take really on the ooda loop to observe orient uh, decide and act faster than your adversary uh but taking on a grander scale and then the inclusion of the joint force uh, in the second iteration of project convergence because you know that the, the Army, the Air Force, the Navy, Marine Corps, never, or Space Force never fight on their own. So it's always part of the joint force and involving them in, in what I call it a learning experiment uh, or learning uh, opportunity. And then some very close partners and allies in the most recent uh, project convergence uh, because the United States will never fight alone. Um, and so just getting the Army started down that path of of understanding the technology behind what Palmer mentioned and what you know the ability to to decide and act faster than any any opponent anywhere in the world uh I, that was pro the the baseline for project convergence so that would be the last one I would highlight great you know one thing you said uh earlier in your comments really caused me to uh to pause a second because I think uh, our soldiers are the ones that are the greatest proof point, as you also uh, referred to earlier. And when we give them things uh, that they're supposed to consider taking into combat uh, or into the war um, and, and adding to their already sometimes 120 pound rucksack that they're gonna have on their back, uh, and you served uh, in Afghanistan and Iraq. But when you're asking a soldier to put something else uh, in, in the ruck uh, that's going to add to the 120 pounds they're going to be carrying on their back, scaling a, a, a mountain or a ravine or something, uh, you know, they'll be the first ones to give you your, your test of that. <laughs> and it'll probably be laying back on the issuance table. Uh, you know, and not going with them uh, for good reason. So um, that just, your mention of that um, is is so true. Uh, th they'll be the deciding point on what they're going to carry, carry with them uh, and good for them. Uh, also, you just mentioned something that also triggered a thought. And there's, uh, and, and one of our other speakers today mentioned JADC2. Yeah. Uh, I, I wonder if you couldn't just, uh, that was a joint program. You mentioned joint uh, and how you brought together Project Convergence uh, to, the, to the, the joint environment of what you were trying to add. 
But can you give us any insights into uh, into your thoughts about Jad C two of where it uh, where it began, maybe where it is now, and some of the difficulties that we're maybe experiencing? Yeah, the um, and so you know Jad C two and it's it's a it's a noun and a verb I think, and I've heard people uh, I think a, a Navy uh, admiral or captain you know kind of described it as. It's a verb, or verb, not a noun, uh, and, it, it, and it's eventually going to have to be, a, you know, a number of nouns to make it uh, programs and capabilities to make it up. But, um, you know, it, there was a JAD C two office at at the uh, at the Pentagon on the Joint Staff, um, and I, you know, I, it really started with ABMS with the Air Force, if my recollection is correct, um, and. It was about connecting things. I think it was, you know, the 35s and 22s to begin with. And then it was, and then, you know, we started talking about uh, the ability to connect Air Force sensors to Army shooters. Um, and then, you know, it made sense that, you know, the Navy's got a number of significant sensors to Army shooters or Army sensors, Patriot radar, for instance, to an F-35. Uh, either Air Force or Marine Corps, or, you know, we always put a C in front of JAD C2, C JAD C2 for the coalition piece, because F-35s are proliferating through the world. And it was all about, and I, you know, and I probably look at this very simplicity, uh, very simplistic, and you did mention I was an infantry officer up front, but, you know, how do you connect the best sensor to the best shooter, regardless of what service in the U.S. that sensor and shooter belongs to, or, you know, the coalition force, what, you know, who has the best sensor and who has the best shooter to prosecute that target in the least amount of time. And he gets back to that acting faster than an adversary. So that's really where it started. And it sounds very simple. And it turns out to be quite difficult um, when you look at the, you know, and it's data is everything. Um, and, you know, I'll talk bad about my service uh, and I'm not sure anybody else is any better, but we're not very good about managing our data and maintaining authoritative databases. Um, and so how do you move that data transport from that sensor through only the required command and control headquarters? Not every headquarters needs to see that to get it to the right decision maker in a way that enables that decision maker to move that data very quickly to the right shooter and prosecute that target. Um, and like I said, it sounds very simple, but there's, um, and, and the thing that makes it hard is, you know, if we were designing everything from scratch and buying everything new, it would probably be much simpler. All the services have billions and billions of dollars worth of legacy equipment that have to be part of this network. People call it a kill web, uh, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but it's how do you, retrograde or incorporate legacy equipment um, in with newer equipment with data streams and applications that were never designed to talk to each other. Um, and so that's what, that, you know, that's what we try to do at Project Convergence, to be honest with you, is just because I, I'm always, I've been convinced from the beginning is you can get anything to work in the lab, put it in the hands of soldiers, sailors, and Marines and guardians and make it work in the dirt. If we can make it work in the dirt, then I think that we've got at least something that we can continue to pursue. So right. Um, you know, I guess we ought to say uh, that uh, Jan C2, for those who might not be as familiar with it, is Joint All Domain Command and Control. And uh, I appreciate the fact that uh, you added a, a coalition uh, piece to that because that's the way uh, we do fight these days. Uh, and uh, uh, so coalition, uh, JAD C2. And uh, frankly, uh, lately I've been talking and even wrote a recent article about the fact that command and control, the last element of JAD C2, is an end that we try to get as far as command and control, but the means to getting that is through communications. So I've even been talking about, you know, we may need to think about JAD C2 as JAD C3 of command control communications. Uh, because as you mentioned, you know, putting all these data links and everything together, 
and connecting with all of these various military objects out there, whether it be Army, Navy, Air Force, uh, Marines, Space Force, um, all of those elements, uh, you know, need to be connected. Uh, and that's through our communications. And sometimes we forget about that part, thinking it's just going to magically happen. So uh, anyway, uh, another thought that I had about the, the JADC2 effort uh, today and your point about uh, considering that with coalition is exactly what we're looking at in today's uh, uh, operations and, and conflicts that are, that are going on. So um, I wanted to uh, ask you, uh, we've got just a, a couple minutes left, but tell us, now you've been out for 15 months. You and I haven't had a chance to sit down and have a soda pop together or anything. But uh, you know, what are you doing now uh, in in your post uh, active duty uh, role, and especially uh, as president of M4 and Associates LLC? Well, it's uh, I, I'm learning a lot. Would be the, the the short way to sum that up. And we just uh, we just got back from a month in Florida, which I was never able to do before with Jane, um, to uh, snow this morning. So it's it's uh, we're back in Ohio and back to reality with the snow, not not sitting at the beach in uh, Amelia Island. The um, so you know it's I I decided I want to continue to try to help, um, and so I'm I'm doing some board work uh, with some bigger companies. And I'm doing some individual consulting with some small uh, startups, basically. One's uh, pre-Series A, um, one just completed uh, their B round, and the other one is somewhere in between. And it was really trying to help them work through uh, what I said is a bureaucracy that still moves way too slow to recognize what's available out there. Um, and I and I told you I spent too much time away from the headquarters first year. I, and I was all over the country, I did Silicon Valley, up around Seattle, Tacoma, Minneapolis, uh, New York City, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, just all over. And I came back just incredibly impressed with how much innovation uh, is out there that, that the Army was just not even aware of, let alone taking advantage of. So I've, I've selected a few of them, try to help bring uh, the Army's attention to some capabilities that I think will help with what I started at, at AFC. Well, that's that's great. And I'm glad you had some getaway time uh, down there in the in the warmer areas. Uh, Julie and I just had a chance to get away for a few days ourselves down in the Florida area, down in the uh, down in the Keys down there. So always good uh, to do that, to refresh and everything, but uh, also uh, good to get back to the work. And I appreciate, uh, Mike, the fact that you have uh, wanted to continue, uh, you know, to serve our country uh, in, in, in national security pursuits and all. I really appreciate the fact that you joined us here today and really gave us some superb insights into uh, a stand-up of a brand new four-star uh, major command of the Army uh, in its initial days. And again, my hat's off to you, and I salute you for all you did in bringing that massive, tough organization together and defining its its way forward and all the accomplishments you had uh, in, those, in those three years that you had at forming Army Futures Command. And, uh, you know, I think about today, uh, you've really given us uh, a, a an executive summary and some cliff notes of uh, the first three years uh, and the evolution of Army Futures Command. And we can't thank you enough for your service to our nation and your continuing service for national security. So thank you very much. And our best to Jane and the family. And thanks, Harry. And best to Julie and yours. Thank you. All right. Over to you, David. <laughs> 